was heavy. I struggled just to make it through the day. But suddenly I felt a holy reverence. And the pain inside began to just slip away. Right away I knew that something had just happened. You see, I felt it in expressions on each face. <laughs> Taken by surprise, I felt his presence. And I knew that this must be a holy place. There is healing in this house, healing in this house, manifested peace to all troubled hearts. With healing balm, there is healing in this house. Restoration in this place. There is mercy, there is grace. Though you're heavy laden, come, bring your burdens one by one. Leave them where they now belong. There is healing in this house. There is healing in this house. There is healing in this house. Yes, manifest and peace to calm troubled hearts. With healing balm, there is healing in this house. Restoration in this place. There is mercy, there is grace. And though you're heavy laden, come. Bring your burdens one by one. Leave them here where they belong For this healing in this house We thank you, Jesus, for your healing Healing for your soul Healing for your mind If you're heavy laden There is peace for troubled times You see there's healing for your soul Yes, there's healing for your mind As the song says, there is healing in this house. Whether we're meeting in person or via computer, because the central truth of restoration, my friends, whether it be physical or emotional, that central truth of restoration is active. It's alive in the spiritual house that is within each one of us. Today, right now, there's healing in your house. If you're just joining us live or on a replay, welcome. Our lesson today is going to be focusing on God's kingdom. Now, as the title card and sentence said, God's 
Wabi Sabi Kingdom on Earth. Kind of weird, huh? God's Wabi Sabi Kingdom on Earth. Um, of course, your first question is probably Wabi Sabi Kingdom. Well, I'm going to be uh, getting to that in just a moment. But first, let's quickly review what my approach has been in these lessons so far. Now, as I've mentioned on a couple of occasions, there are, in fact, many ways to define and describe the kingdom of God, what kingdom means. Most frequently, the emphasis in the past several decades has been aspects of uh, a governmental order and uh, obedience to that governmental order. But frankly, Western societies like the United States, don't effectively grasp the idea of kingdom or the emphasis and order of kingdom life because, frankly, we don't understand. We don't live in a kingdom as such, a monarch, uh, monarchy. Our governmental patterns have some similarities to kingdom living, but still, Government by kingdom rule and order is different than a democratic republic like in the United States of America. Now, that being said, I've taken a different approach to help us understand, uh, understand other aspects, to understand more of what God's kingdom is actually about in more of a full look, full spectrum of that. My focus in these lessons has been more of looking at the kingdom of God through the eyes and the lens of um, qualities and characteristics of God as demonstrated through the expression of his spiritual giftings, uh, through uh, the descriptions of the fruit of the spirit and, and tying that into what kingdom is also about on from that aspect. His kingdom certainly includes governmental structure and order and obeying of his ways, but I also believe we need to allow our understanding of the kingdom of God to include descriptions of kingdom qualities. That's why in the past three lessons I've focused on these examples, such as one can expect God's kingdom atmosphere, and that's a, that's a way to put it, his kingdom atmosphere, to be one of edification, or in other words, lifting and building up rather than tearing down and promoting feelings of being less than. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that that is not an uncommon uh, atmosphere of the world we live in. It's also the atmosphere of his kingdom that it stirs up with fresh courage. Yeah. As well as comfort. Now, these descriptions, of course, you probably recognize them, are the descriptions of the gift of prophecy. You see, God's kingdom is filled with his words. And so they logically are going to be mirroring prophetic utterance. Are you with me so far? That then shows that the more we are under kingdom authority and influence in our lives, the more our, our words and our actions will in fact mirror the spirit of prophecy. Now, uh, here's a verse in Revelation 19.10 that I also want to insert here. Revelation 19.10 is speaking about Jesus. It says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Therefore, uh, the testimony or witness and words of Jesus, we can say, are also the spirit of his kingdom. Are you with me so far? Let me repeat that. Since the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, according to Revelation 19.10, therefore we can say the testimony or witness and words of Jesus are also the spirit of his kingdom. Amen? 
Now, speaking that which has the energy of edifying and encouraging and comforting uh, according to the need of the person and the moment is the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. Now, let me ask you this question, because you may be asking me this question. How does one know what the need of the moment is for that uh, particular person? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, here's the thing. We're not expected to do this on our own. As a matter of fact, really living the Christian life, truly the kingdom life, Christian life, kingdom life, is impossible in our own strength, on our own. As a matter of fact, chances are that whenever we try to figure out how to manifest the kingdom of God in and of ourselves, if we're trying to do that from our own wisdom and our own knowledge and, well, I, you know, I got saved, I didn't check my brains at the door, I should be able to figure this out on my own, we're going to likely slip down the slippery slope of flesh and ego. Well, instead of defaulting to the tree of life, we'll default to the place where humanity went rogue and decided it could live life without the help and guidance of God. Now, having said that, we can, I believe we can learn to rely, it's going to take some intentional work, but we can learn to rely on Holy Spirit to default us to the tree of life. And so, how do we learn to function from the realm, from the authority of God's kingdom within us? By learning to actively stay connected to the Holy Spirit for help. See, that's really an important part. I, I, I consider that one of my most important tasks in life. My most important missions in life. To learn to actively stay connected to the Holy Spirit and to his help for me. And then to help others learn practically the same thing. Now, besides using the gift of prophecy to describe the kingdom atmosphere, we also pointed to the fruit of the Spirit. And so the kingdom atmosphere, uh, it'll feel like, it will seem like, it'll have the atmosphere of, uh, it'll have the aroma of the kingdom of God. If we're walking in that, functioning in that, it'll have the aroma of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so forth, that are described uh, in Galatians as the fruit of the Spirit. All right, enough review. But now, so today, because I, I know you're wondering about it, let's move on to God's wabi-sabi kingdom on earth. And I believe you're going to find this encouraging. So the first thing I actually need to do, though, is explain the meaning of wabi-sabi. You see, wabi-sabi, that's two words of the Japanese language that approximates the English phrase, beauty in the lack of perfection. Wabi-sabi, Japanese for beauty in the lack of perfection. Wabi-sabi, or beauty, uh, beauty in the lack of perfection, is it's really a wisdom for, it's not, not just definitions of words, but it's, it's a kind of wisdom for living a fulfilling life. And, and I believe that that's one of the things that, that that culture got right and described by Wabi Sabi. I believe it's very kingdom in the earth in, in many ways. You see, it's not about, though, in any way, shape, or form, a, a promotion of sloppy or careless living. Uh, don't mistake that. Don't misunderstand that. See, it's instead, it's a divorcing from the drive of perfectionism. You know anything about that? The drive of perfectionism? Well, let me explain perfectionism. To understand perfectionism, perfectionism isn't 
the desire to do things well. It's it's more of a, and listen to this, it's a fear-based striving to eliminate error lest you be seen by others or even God as inferior or less than. Shall I repeat that? Perfectionism. It isn't the desire to do things right, the desire to do things well, as good as you can. It's more of the driving influence behind it is more of a fear-based striving to eliminate error. And this is the important part. I got to eliminate that error because if I don't, I'm going to be seen by others and even by God as inferior or less than. And uh, honestly, to be transparent, I, I struggled and still have areas where I'm personally overcoming perfectionism in my own life. Now, in my case, perfectionism is expressed with that inner uh, gnawing feeling of not doing or being enough. Perfectionism, that's how it manifests inside of me. I'm not doing enough, I'm not being enough, but little by little, the Holy Spirit and I are winning that battle. But if you are familiar with it, and I think probably several people watching this are, the battle with perfectionism can be, at times, pretty daunting. It sounds so reasonable to be and do the best you can, and it is. And on one side of the coin, that, that is valid. Doing one's best is good. But when the whole thing makes you anxious and you have fears of being rejected by people because they think, or you think that they think, you're not doing enough, or being afraid that God is going to be disappointed in you and won't bless you if you don't figure out how to do more, well, that's a terrible minefield to walk in, isn't it? And of course, it certainly isn't the walk of faith. The kingdom walk of faith is not the journey of perfectionism, but the life of rest in spite of your imperfections because God is able to make everything work together for good. More on that in a minute. But first, as we talk about God's kingdom being wabi-sabi in the earth or beauty in imperfection, a seeming contradiction to that may arise in your minds from the words found in Matthew 5, 8, which says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, what's important to realize here is that the Hebrew language in the Hebrew language, one word can have more than one meaning, okay? So then you ask the question, how do you know which meaning to use? Well, enter my favorite hobby horse. Context, context, context. That's how you know. You see, when we read Matthew 5, 48 in context, uh, in context where it says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's not about being sinless here on the earth and striving for sinlessness as your heavenly Father is sinless. It, what it's about in its context, and I'm not justifying sinful attitudes and actions. We're talking about context here of being perfect. In its context, it is about being inclusive. It's about mature love being demonstrated by including those who are different, who, who look different, who act different, who have different opinions of what truth is all about. In other words, pulling them toward you rather than pushing them away from you. Let me say that again. Inclusive, uh, inclusive perfection uh, perfect, as it is in Matthew 5.18, is about pulling people that are different toward you rather than pushing them away from you. 
you know, those people who are different than you, those, those people who talk, think, look, act, and believe some things different than you, even doctrinally, can I say even politically? When we were in language school in Mexico, our teacher, Gabby, told us that we as Americans would do some things differently than, than her Mexican brothers and sisters. And that we needed to know that their way was not wrong. It was just different. And we would begin to get a lot better, along a lot better in our culture shock as we realized that what they did different than us was not wrong, it was just different. And so, wabi-sabi, the beauty in imperfection. When an artist or potter lives by wabi-sabi, uh, and it can be any kind of art, artisanship, an attitude and ap uh, appreciation of wabi-sabi, when they have that, they are intentionally allowing, in fact, folding in to their work what we would call imperfections, uh, what many would consider to be flaws. And, and they are allowing those things to remain in their creations or they are intentionally putting them into their uh, creations. Uh, example, making furniture with what's called distressed wood. Wood with imperfections is an example of making a table according to wabi-sabi. They consider that uh, the imperfections add to the beauty and individuality of that table. Now, our individuality, which includes our scars that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to touch, potentially gives us a unique beautiful uh, image to God. It gives us an individuality. It makes us beautiful before him because he can see the finished picture and he can see its value. You see, we live in a distressed world. This distressed world carves scars on all of us. But God's cleansing and healing is not likely to take the scars away, but instead make them as part of our unique individual trophies of his grace. We're not Stepford children to God. Okay, now, let, let's look at an Old Testament example. I was just thinking of this example from Jacob. You recall Jacob's limp. Jacob's limp after wrestling with the angel for blessing him because he wrestled with the angel. He was demanding a blessing. He wouldn't let go until the angel blessed him. It left him with a limp. It left him with a permanent limp. His limp was a mark, though, not of weakness, but it was a mark of beautiful character, and it pointed to the beauty of persistence. Another example, wounds from the cross's nails remained with Jesus. They were not a sign of loss and defeat, but the beauty of salvation's victory. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned Romans 8.28. It says that God, in his infinite wisdom, can make everything, every scar, every wound, every mistreatment, every misunderstanding, every trial, work together for good. And remember, in the scriptures, the word good means far more than, well, that was a good cake. It means to work as designed. I'm defining good for you right now. The fullness of the word good in the scriptures. It means to work as designed, to be beautiful. It's starting to come together here. To be magnificent. All right, with that in mind, let's look again at Romans 8.28. For we know... We realize from experience, that's what it means to know, but we realize from experience that God can cause all things to work for our beauty, our magnificence, and as we were originally designed as mankind. Now, sometimes there are wounds 
that we have received that with the help of the Holy Spirit actually help us to be a strength and a comfort that helps others overcome their pain. Uh, let's refer to 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 here. It says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, because remember I'm talking about earlier about relying upon the Holy Spirit, uh, working with these wounds, uh, who comforts us in all. What does the word all mean? It means everything, every kind of, all our tribulations, that we may be able then to comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. You see, that I believe that's kingdom, that's God's kingdom beauty that comes out of imperfections. Those things that I just described, those are just different ways of describing that. The scars that remain points to salvation through pain. The scars that remain points to salvation from the pain. God's wabi-sabi kingdom in the earth is anything but a demand that is pushing you to strive for perfectionism. God's kingdom on earth is about the perfection of Jesus on our behalf. It's about our imperfections he cleanses and somehow mysteriously makes into a beautiful works of art. The reality of God's kingdom in the earth is not about us trying to hide our wounds and lacks, nor is it about us flaunting the dark side of our humanity. Uh, humanity. It's about us having been given the gift of grace. It's about us recognizing and relying upon the Holy Spirit to help us transform from grace to grace and glory to glory. Glory to glory meaning the weight of increasing authority and beauty. That's what glory means. And leaving us with glorified scars to help us remember that brings honor and praise to a glorious God. Well, let me leave us today with a part of Jesus' prayer. This is found in John 17, verses 22 and 23. And this is going to, uh, in this, because I just defined glory for us, in this particular verse, or these two verses, I'm going to change the word of glory to authority and beauty, because, as I said, that's what glory means in everyday language. Let me read it for us now. I have given them the authority and beauty that you have given me. Again, I have given them, that's a free gift, I have given them the authority and beauty that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, that they would be folded in with us, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. I am them and you and me with all of our scars so that, because Jesus has, still has his scars too, different kind of scars, but this is a, an expression that I really believe is helpful for us to understand. I am them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Huh. So that they may be brought to complete unity. May I ask you a question right now? What's your priority right now? To be right? Or to be a healer and a unifier? Uh, I'm asking that question in the context. Remember, context is a big thing for me. I'm asking that question in the context right now of our splintered, divided, political, religious, brother-sister environment. So my question is, what's your priority right now to be right or to be a healer, to be a unifier? 
asking the Holy Spirit how you might do that. That is constantly what I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me personally. Then it says, then the world will know and experience that you sent me and I have loved them even or in the same manner and amount as you, Father, have loved me. Now that's extraordinary. That's an extraordinary prayer of truth and a description of the kingdom of God in the earth. As I leave you today, you may have scars. If you're human, you, you do. Know that to God you are loved and beautiful and he's never giving up on you. Let's not give up on each other, okay? With God's help, your scars can become beautiful reminders of his grace. Think about it. Talk to him about it. Till next time.